Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Pell Center, and thanks for coming out on this crisp fall evening. For those who don't already know me, my name is Iskander Raymond, and I'm the Senior Fellow for International Relations here at the Pell Center. I'm very excited about our event here tonight, not only because it's incredibly timely, as some of you may know the US President is visiting South Korea as we speak, but also because we have two fantastic panelists here with us tonight. Ankit Panda is the senior editor at The Diplomat and perhaps one of the sharpest Asia watchers that I know. He, along with Vipin Narang, a professor at MIT, has been doing some fantastic recent work on North Korea's nuclear program. Professor Terence Rorig is the director of the Asia Pacific Studies group at the US Naval War College and one of the foremost scholars on Korean security issues. And you know, I have to say one of the things that I do love about living here, apart from the beaches and the wonderful seafood, of course, is having access to such a great group of Asia specialists just across town over at the Naval War College. And I think we're really lucky as a community uh, to have such a reservoir of expertise in such close proximity to Salve. Uh, now, Terence has published a number of excellent books on Northeast Asian security issues, including his most recent work, which came out earlier this fall, and which is very appropriately entitled Japan, South Korea, and the United States Nuclear Umbrella Deterrence After the Cold War. Now, I'm sure anyone in this room who regularly reads the newspaper or watches cable news has heard a lot about North Korea and its eccentric pot-bellied leader over the past few months. Um, all too often, however, the coverage is dominated by footage of flaring rockets, by disturbing sound bites and barked frets from Donald Trump's talk of fire and fury and total annihilation to North Korea's threats to turn Seoul, a city of 10 million people, into a sea of fire. We've heard the North Korean dictator call the leader of the free world a mentally deranged dotard, and we've seen US presidential tweets derisively refer to Kim Jong-un as Little Rocket Man, which I have to be honest is actually a pretty good nickname. Um, but what you don't often get is a calm, dispassionate analysis of the many complex issues at stake and a discussion that doesn't make you want to immediately rush out and buy a backup generator and a crate of canned goods. So we're hoping to provide that measure of calm nuance for you here this evening. We want to make sure that you sleep well tonight after tonight's event, even if our poor friends at the Pentagon and State Department may not. Um, we in the West have a bit of a strange relationship when it comes to the Korean issue. The Korean War, which raged over the course of three years from 1950 to 1953 and continues to hold many useful lessons for military historians to this day, has somewhat fallen through the cracks of our collective historic consciousness. As one historian has noted, of all the wars the United States has fought, the war in Korea ranks among the most important, yet it is the least remembered. Americans fought in Korea nearly three times as long as they fought in World War I, and almost as long as they fought in World War II. Yet the conflict has faded from the public imagination. Although total ca American casualties were heavy, with over 33,000 killed and 103,000 wounded, there are no great iconic war movies about the Korean War, the way Apocalypse Now, for example, defined the Vietnam War, or Saving Private Ryan or The Longest Day helped define World War II. As many have noted, the Korean War has become our great forgotten war, one which we sometimes also forget never really ended. Indeed, the tenuous peace that has reigned on the peninsula has been maintained not by treaty, but by an armistice. And when we do look at the Korean peninsula, we tend to look at these issues almost exclusively through the lens of its nuclear program, or by laughingly commenting on the somewhat absurd theatrics of its leadership. We sometimes neglect the fact that North Korea also possesses, if only in terms of sheer numbers, the fourth largest conventional military in the world, or to overlook the reality of its horrendous systematic human rights abuses. This is a country of thousands of pieces of artillery aimed at a key ally, a dynastic despotic leadership, and a sprawling network of concentration camps. The reality of the matter is, as I'm sure will be made clear tonight, one cannot compartmentalize these issues and challenges the vile nature of this regime and its concerns over its own stability and survival are innately linked to its determined pursuit of a nuclear weapons program, the development of which we cannot in turn view in separation from some of the conventional military dynamics 
in a country where, let's not forget, close to 28,500 US military personnel are stationed. So it's with all this in mind that I asked our two excellent panels to prepare their presentations for tonight. First of all, Professor Rorig is going to give us an overview of the conventional military dynamics on the Korean Peninsula and of some of the considerable challenges the US military and its allies would face in the event of a conflict, even in the complete absence of nuclear weapons. I'll then ask Ankit Panta to address the nuclear side of the equation. Each speaker will speak for about 15 minutes, and then I will ask them one or two follow-up questions before opening it up to the floor. So without further ado, Professor Rorig, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It is an absolute pleasure to be here and to have a chance to talk with you for uh, the evening in regards to a very serious security problem and one that uh, has some very difficult uh, possibilities to it and one that has been uh, defying solution and I'm afraid is probably not going to give you a whole lot of good news in that regard tonight. But I think one that is extremely important for us to understand the details in regards to what is happening in, in North Korea and, and how we can deal with the country in the future. As Iskander said, I am going to address first the current military balance and then I'll talk a little bit about what South Korea has been doing in regards to dealing with North Korea. Sorry about the table here, but I think this is an important place to start when we look at the conventional military balance currently, but also perhaps the notion that there was a time when North Korea didn't have nuclear weapons, and this, these numbers are what were central to how we looked at Korean security. Let me start by pointing out a few of the numbers that are most significant. First of all, you see North Korea has almost 1.2 million soldiers in its military. That ranks it number four in the world in total numbers, and on a per capita basis, that is the largest military in the world. The United States has about 2,800, excuse me, 28,000 soldiers there. That is down considerably from years past when we had two full combat divisions in Korea, uh, 60,000 plus troops up until the 1970s. And so that number has evolved in regards to Korean security. You look at some of the other numbers and it looks like North Korea has a considerable advantage. 4,000 tanks compared to the South Korean 2000, but many of the North Korean tanks are old Soviet and Chinese models that have some difficulty in regards to um, their technology, spare parts, fuel, etc. So those numbers need to be taken with a very serious grain of salt. Perhaps the most serious number on here is the artillery number that you see. 8,500 artillery tubes the North Koreans have, 5,100 multiple rocket launcher systems, a large share of this, 70%, are deployed close to the demilitarized zone, which means in many respects we focus on nuclear weapons for North Korea. The North Koreans don't need nuclear weapons to in, inflict an awful lot of harm on South Korea. And so when you hear a lot of the discussion about not very many good military options because of what North Korea can do, it is the artillery capability. And the slide, the map below, is one showing where the black dots are where North Korea's artillery and rocket systems are deployed. The circles are their ranges. If you look to the south, you can see Seoul in the dark um, orangish color there. A lot of those systems can reach Seoul. And so the North Koreans have a capability to in inflict a lot of destruction on the capital city if it chose to do so. Uh, in regards to combat aircraft, uh, again, the North Koreans look like they are doing quite well, but many of those planes are, again, old Soviet model planes. They are lacking in spare parts, in fuel. One of the estimates about the uh, training that a North Korean pilot goes through is about 20 hours per year. When I say that number to my American students who are pilots, they chuckle. That is a considerably small uh, amount of training that a pilot would go through. So while the numbers look large, the readiness and capabilities of the North Korean Air Force are, are questionable. 
And then lastly, the ships and submarines. Again, the North Koreans look like they have a significant number advantage, but a lot of those ships are very small coastal patrol vessels. It is divided when you recall that North Korea has two coastlines on east and west. They have to split that number between two coasts, and they're never going to get them back and forth if there is ever a war. Plus, a large share of those ships are actually in dry dock, again, for lack of fuel and spare parts. So while you see these numbers, it is not necessarily a North Korean advantage in a number of ways. However, do not, misunder or do not underestimate the North Korean ability to invoke a lot of pain on the South if it chose to do so, even though some of these numbers um, are, um, the capability behind some of these numbers are misleading. Let me also end with a couple of numbers that I think are interesting. Uh, when you look at defense spending as a percentage of your gross domestic product, for the United States, that is 3.3% of our GDP is spent on defense. For South Korea, it's 2.7%. For the North Koreans, it is somewhere between 20 and 30%. So the North Korean regime puts a lot of its economic uh, productivity into the defense industry because it feels it needs that uh, to be able to maintain its defense of the Kim family regime, et cetera, et cetera. So what has South Korea been doing about the North Korean threat? I think you have to go back to 2009 and 2010 as an important turning point. First of all, in May of 2009, North Korea tested its second nuclear weapon. The first time it tested, it was a very low yield. Many experts concluded that it was probably a dud. 2009 was much more of a, of a success and indicated that the North Koreans were not going to give up on its nuclear ambitions and was going to continue. Then in 2010, a pretty bad year in Korean security. In March, you had the South Korean ship, the Chonan, sunk towards the north where you see Bengyong Island um, in the upper uh, left-hand part of the uh, map by a North Korean submarine. Then in November, the North Koreans shelled a South Korean island, which is shown on this particular map, Yunpyeong Island. And after the shelling, the, North, the South Koreans were ready to retaliate. They had had enough. They felt that it was time to send the North Koreans a message. The United States essentially talked the South Koreans off the ledge. And we have been very reluctant to take military action because of starting a larger war. We tried to talk the South Koreans off of that um, option. And they did grudgingly, but the North Korean government, excuse me, the South Korean government said after this, if this happens again, if North Korea conducts another military option or action in the future, we will respond. And I think we t have taken them at their word. I think the North Koreans have taken them at their word. Not testing, that's a separate issue, but conducting these kinds of actual military actions against the South. The South, the South Koreans have said they will respond, and I think they will. In the wake of that, the United States and South Korea, because we have a very close alliance, conducted a number of different reviews of our planning options. And so we reviewed a number of different elements of that. We revised our plans to respond to these types of provocative actions. We also have revised our plans to deal with nuclear weapons and biological and chemical weapons. And in particular, you have heard a lot of discussion over the last number of months about decapitation strikes, about possible preemption, and those kinds of things are part of these plans. But those are when we get into some pretty dangerous um, areas, in my view. When you look at our planning and our public announcements about this, the North Koreans, of course, no surprise that they responded saying, well, we have our own decapitation plans and preemption plans. If both sides in a crisis have strong plans to preempt, then you have a lot of incentive for going first, to be the first one to attack. And so in a crisis, that has some very difficult and some concerning issues for crisis stability when we get to those sorts of tension levels. The South Koreans have also gone on their own to build something that they call their triad. 
And it has three parts, and there's sort of a progression to this. First of all, the South Koreans have developed what they call the kill chain, which is their capabilities to be able to preempt if they see a North Korean threat, a North Korean attack as imminent. That they, as most would argue, they do not have to take an attack before they can, can respond. If you see an, an, an attack being imminent, you can attack first. And so they have developed ballistic missiles, they have also developed cruise missiles, and they have their own aircraft can, that can hit North Korean targets if they see a North Korean attack as imminent. The South Koreans have also moved to develop their own ballistic missile defense system. Now, interesting here is the United States has been trying to build a regional ballistic missile architecture in the region. The Japanese have been all on board for that. But the South Koreans have been reluctant. They have maintained that they want to develop their own independent ballistic missile defense system, in part because of cost, but in large measure because of the very strong reaction they would likely get from China if they decide to join the US ballistic missile defense system. You had a bit of that play out when the United States deployed THAAD batteries on um, the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense Missile System that you see there. The Chinese had a very strong economic reaction to the South Koreans for doing that, uh, boycotted South Korean products, canceled the concerts of a number of major South Korean uh, entertainers who were planning on coming to China. It really hit the South Korean economy hard. But over the last week, there have been indications that the Chinese and the South Koreans have been able to sort of patch this up. Uh, but nonetheless, it is why the South Koreans, in response to this last week, the president has reportedly agreed that they will not for sure join the US ballistic missile defense system, and it is going to be a separate, independent ballistic missile capability. Well, then if you miss the preemption and stuff gets through on a ballistic missile defense system, then you get to the last part of the triad, and that is Korea massive punishment and retaliation. And it is plans that if the North Koreans attack the South, they will hammer the North Korean capital city of Pyongyang in particular, uh, trying to hit leadership targets and take out the Kim family regime. Now, all of this is intended to deter the North Koreans. Everyone hopes that none of this ever has to be used, but it is about making these kinds of preparations and statements, acquiring these kinds of capabilities to reinforce deterrence. Let me end with two other final comments here and, and then turn it over um, to our next speaker. Some other options that you are hearing discussed in South Korea. One is the return of US tactical nuclear weapons. From 1958 to 1991, the United States had tactical nuclear weapons deployed to South Korea. We removed those weapons for a number of different reasons, for security reasons in the Korean Peninsula, but also as part of the end of the Cold War, we were trying to encourage the Soviets to rein in their own deployed tactical nuclear weapons. And so this was part of a, a larger package deal, but now you are having some South Koreans, particularly conservatives, arguing for the return of US tactical nuclear weapons. Let me add one other element to this. If that doesn't occur, you also have some of the same conservatives in South Korea arguing for the development of their own nuclear weapons. And they could go nuclear if they wanted to. They have a very robust civilian nuclear energy program. It is world class. They export reactors to a number of different countries and such. They could go nuclear if they wanted to. But Moon Jae-in, their new president, um, has said in no uncertain terms, South Korea is not going to develop its own nuclear weapons, and we are not going to bring US tactical nuclear weapons back because our goal is to denuclearize the peninsula, not to bring more nuclear weapons. And we can talk more about this in the Q&A if, if you'd like to explore some of these issues. Let me just make one final comment about Moon Jae-in. He was elected in May in a special election to replace the previous impeached South Korean President Park Geun-hye. 
And when Moon came in, there was a great deal of speculation that he was coming in as a progressive president, which is the Korean word for the left. And was he going to be so pro-engagement, so willing to deal with North Korea, um, that there was going to be friction between the United States and South Korea? He has turned out to be much more pragmatic than I think many have thought. He certainly leans pro-engagement and has offered that to the North Koreans. But he has not gotten much response from the North Koreans, or frankly, any response. And in that um, vein, then, he has been very willing and has been talking about we need to increase the pressure to bring the North Koreans back to the negotiating table. But it's very clear that war cannot happen on the Korean Peninsula. If the United States is going to use military options, they must be consulted and we must give approval to that and that the only answer to solve the North Korean nuclear problem is diplomacy, even though the, North Kore the South Koreans have undertaken a number of very significant military preparations. But it remains a very difficult problem, and so I now turn it over to the, the even more pleasant nuclear side of these issues. Uh, thank you everyone for coming out today. Thank you Iskander for the invitation and the Pell Center for hosting us. Um, like Terry said, this is going to be a more cheerful conversation. Um, I think Iskander promised everyone here a good night's sleep, so I will try to make sure that you all leave feeling pretty good about what I'm about to say. Um, so I have a presentation here with a few slides with a lot of photographs of North Korean missiles that I want to talk about in some detail. Um, but really, it will sound like 90% of what I have to say is bad news, but the 10% of good news that comes at the end of this presentation, I think, is really the big takeaway, which is this idea that nuclear deterrence with North Korea can work. Um, Terry talked a bit about how deterrence has worked conventionally with North Korea, which is important to appreciate, uh, this idea that North Korea has been able to hold Seoul, a country of 20 plus million people, a metropolitan area of 20 plus million people at risk for years, has prevented at least the temptation for the United States and South Korea to undertake coercive regime change, to uh, kill Kim Jong-un and replace him with another kind of leader or to forcibly unify the peninsula. Um, so with that said, let me um, get a bit into this presentation, which uh, primarily, you know, there are sort of three assumptions that I, I really want to hit home here. The first is that when you leave here today, I want to have convinced you of the fact that Kim Jong-un is rational. And this is not an obvious point. It is certainly not an obvious point in the popular discussion about North Korea. In fact, um, there is good evidence that many uh, policymakers in this current administration do not believe that Kim Jong-un is fully rational, and that is part of the reason why we are hearing things about a U.S. first strike pot potentially being contemplated. Uh, so that's the first assumption, that Kim Jong-un is rational. The second assumption is that Kim Jong-un is rational, and it is still rational for him to use nuclear weapons first, um, which I'll, I'll get a bit into why that's the case when I talk a bit about North Korea's nuclear strategy, about, why, um, about how they would employ their nuclear weapons to avoid uh, regime change forcibly. And then the final assumption, um, uh, the final point that I want to get to is um, based on everything that you're about to hear, uh, there is really no good military option for the United States to coercively change the regime at an acceptable cost. An acceptable cost is a subjective term, but for me it really means avoiding a nuclear war, that uh, any war with North Korea today would effectively be a nuclear war. And um, with that said, let's uh, get right into it. Um, so. I, I want to talk right away about North Korea's nuclear strategy. This is a country that has had nuclear ambitions since the 1960s, potentially the late 1950s, certainly since the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, when it effectively saw the limitations of the Soviet Union's security assurances. So uh, it's not just Kim Jong-un, it's his father, it's his grandfather, Kim Il-sung, who've thought about nuclear weapons. But Kim Jong-un has really been the steward of North Korea's serious and diversified nuclear forces. We've seen an unprecedented level of nuclear testing, of ballistic missile testing under his leadership. And, uh, you know, he has really built this around a clear strategy. Um, so North Korea's nuclear strategy relies on preserving for itself the first use of its short, medium, and intermediate range ballistic missiles. And it has quite a few of these systems. It has a wide variety of these systems. The most familiar of these are its old Scud launchers and Scud systems, which it's had since at least the late 1970s, if not the early 1980s, and it's since reverse engineered and mass produced them. 
It relies on, in what military jargon you'd call soft counterforce strikes, upon detecting a preemptive attempt by the United States and South Korea. So if the United States and South Korea decided to um, change the regime in Pyongyang, uh, they would prevent, you know, presumably there would be signals of that, either aircraft carrier movements, troop movements, evacuations of civilians, uh, U.S. civilians from the Korean Peninsula. Uh, if North Korea detected any kind of activity of that sort, it would use its nuclear weapons first against military targets in, in the Northeast Asian theater. Um, so the objective of this is to degrade the United States and the South Korean ability to sustain a conventional invasion of the peninsula, which is what would be necessary to secure all of North Korea's nuclear weapons before they could be used and to change the regime. And above all, let's take a 30,000 look at the strategy that I, uh, that I just described by kind of making this clear to the United States and South Korea. North Korea expects the United States to take the hint on deterrence, and as a result, it retains its insurance against regime change. Kim Jong-un is a young leader. He is in his early 30s. He wants to grow old in his capacity as North Korea's supreme leader. He has no intentions of allowing the United States or South Korea to forcibly remove him from power, and nuclear weapons are a big part of that. Um, so, uh, everything I just said, actually, I just wanted to draw your attention to this photograph here. So this is Kim Jong-un at a missile test earlier this March. Uh, it was a launch of four Scud missiles. He's pointing to this map, and North Korean propaganda is a very useful source of information about their strategic intentions. So this map, uh, it's, it's unclear in this picture, but the next slide will make it a little bit clearer, shows a, a ballistic missile trajectory from North Korea to uh, Japan, which is interesting because they didn't fire missiles at Japan. Uh, this is a correction of that image that was done by uh, Dave Schmerler at the Center for Nonproliferation Studies in Monterey in California. And if you take a look at the trajectory, you can see that it points actually to the United States Marine Corps Air Base at Iwakuni in Japan. The intention of that ballistic missile test for North Korea was clear. They were rehearsing precisely that kind of first strike that I described. Kim Jong-un releases these photos because he wants pan you know, planners at the Pentagon, he wants independent analysts like myself and Terry and Iskander to take a look at these and really get the hint about what North Korea's nuclear strategy is. And, of course, are, they have their words to use uh, to convey their intention. So here's a quote. Uh, I rely quite a bit on primary source materials from the North Korean state media, which people will correctly point out are, you know, it is propaganda released by the state, but it is quite useful. You know, there is a reason they bother to translate this into English. They want it to be read abroad. They want it to serve as a communication of their strategic intent. So basically, here it is in North Korea's words. If we notice any sign of assault on our sovereignty, our army will launch merciless military strikes against the U.S. aggressors, Wherever they may exist, from the remote U.S. lands to the American military bases on the Korean Peninsula, such of those in Japan and elsewhere. Um, so the remote U.S. lands here, they are referring to the U.S. territory of Guam, which some of you may have read about in headlines in August when North Korea threatened to launch ballistic missiles. So when it comes to their first strike, this is what they're thinking of. Uh, credit for this excellent map goes to the graphics team at the Washington Post, but I really think it does one of the best jobs of illustrating where North Korea would presumably strike with the first nuclear strike once the United States and South Korea had made the decision to move on with a conventional invasion. So they would strike at targets in South Korea that are home to U.S. troops, the 28,000 that Terry was talking about in his presentation. They would strike at um, U.S. bases in Japan, uh, Sasebo Iwakuni. They would strike at Okinawa. And of course, they would strike at Guam, which is where the United States Pacific Command maintains its primary bomber presence, so uh, B-1B bombers and uh, B-2s in, um, in the event of a crisis. Um, and North Korea really hates those bombers, um, bomber flights near its territory, which it's been consistently harping about in its uh, state media this year. Um, all right, now let's talk a bit about their missile systems. So it's, uh, today it's November 7th, so last year, around this time, we were heading into an election, and actually the night of the third presidential debate in the United States, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are debating, North Korea launched one of these missiles, um, a Musudan. It's an intermediate-range ballistic missile. Um, if you'd asked me to give this talk last year at this time, the Musudan would have been effectively the longest range ballistic missile system that North Korea had in, had in its inventory. And it wasn't a very successful missile. It's based on an old uh, Soviet design known as the BM-25 that North Korea has had in its possession since the early 1990s. They received quite a few of these at the, um, when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, including sort of broader scientific information. They tested this missile eight times last year. It only flew successfully one of those times. So really, the Musudan was not a very successful system, but it was a big part of fleshing out that first strike strategy for them. To really make that work, they needed to reach the US territory of Guam at a minimum. That was a really important milestone for North Korea. But the Musudan just didn't cut it. Um, 
these images, uh, with the exception of the one in the top right corner, are um, from 2017. Um, so these systems that are um, described here are a very important part of North Korea's first strike military strategy, so uh, nuclear strategy. So the KN-18 here, it's, a, it's based on the Scud missile that I was talking about. The Scud is a liquid-fueled ballistic missile. It is uh, one of the most famous ballistic missiles in existence, the most widely proliferated. Um, North Korea has been a big part of that proliferation over its decades of operations of the system. North Korea is very familiar with how Scud missiles operate, and so they've gotten around to modifying them. So this missile, which the U.S. intelligence community calls the KN-18, is a modified Scud missile. Um, and the important modification that I'll draw your attention to, I know everybody here isn't a missile geek like I am, but the, the main modification that you should pay attention to is the control fins, uh, the surfaces uh, that you see on the warhead. You see those fins right there? That suggests that they have modified this to become a far more precise, um, a far more of a precision strike system. Uh, Scuds have an important limitation when it comes to a first strike strategy relying on hitting precise military targets, which is that they're not very precise. Uh, the only thing SCUDs are very good for are um, effectively saturating um, population areas. Uh, this is something that we've seen um, most recently with the Houthis. Uh, they've been firing these missiles at Saudi Arabian cities, uh, most recently Riyadh just this weekend. Um, but the North Koreans are trying to convert their existing inventory of SCUDs into precision strike systems. Um, and then, of course, the North Koreans have their Nodongs and they have their Scud 2s or extended range Scuds, which are um, effectively just longer range versions of these missiles that are capable of potentially striking targets in Japan, um, in addition to all of South Korea. Um, and below that launch, uh, with, the, with the four missiles that you see, that took place in early March this year. It's the first time North Korea had actually done a launch like that, where they simultaneously demonstrated a capability to launch four Scud missiles, showing that they could effectively give you know, U.S. missile defense in the Northeast Asian theater um, quite a run for its money. By launching multiple missiles at the same time at a specific target, you stress missile defense systems like THAAD. Um, they have battle management software, which was effectively a computer that has to deal with multiple targets. Um, ballistic missile defense is not an easy enterprise. And the more targets there are, the harder it gets. Uh, so the North Koreans are, are sending all of these messages that they, too, get a vote in how a nuclear war plays out in Northeast Asia and what they're planning on doing is using multiple missiles. Um, so let me briefly talk about this missile, which is the Pukuk Song 1, or the KN-11, as the US intelligence community calls it. Pukuk Song translates to Polaris, um, and as you'll notice, it is coming out of the water. It is North Korea's first submarine launch ballistic missile. Yes, they named their first submarine launch ballistic missile Polaris, which I find a little amusing. Um, but uh, this missile is the cornerstone of North Korea's second strike capability that um, in the event of a nuclear war, if North Korea's missiles were to be eliminated, it would effectively maintain some sort of retaliatory capability. There is a limitation here, which is that they have one submarine currently in operation. Um, there is evidence, though, that they are building a second submarine, which suggests that this isn't simply a bureaucratic prestige play, just about having kind of two legs of a nuclear triad in their position. They are thinking seriously about a sea-based nuclear strike capability. And also, um, I'll talk a bit about another um, a significant development here, which is that the Pukuk Song 1 is North Korea's first um, strategic missile that uses solid fuel. Um, solid and liquid fuel are effectively the two main propellant types. Um, there are advantages to solid fuel that I'll talk about, that I'll talk about a bit on the next slide, but uh, if you want to think about the difference, it helps to think about barbecues and the difference between using sort of propane, which is clean burning, versus using charcoal. Um, that's effectively the same principle, a little oversimplified, but that's basically the difference between solid fuel and liquid fuel. Um, this missile looks pretty similar to what I just showed you, except the main difference is that it is taking place on land um, from an integrated transporter erector launcher, so that ugly truck that sits below it with a canister carries what is effectively a land-based version of that solid fuel submarine launch ballistic missile. This is something the North Koreans learned from the Chinese who actually took the JL-1 submarine launch ballistic missile, transferred it to land, and, effect and eventually had the DF-21. Um, so this is something that the North Koreans have learned from and replicated with their own program. You see that very dirty smoke up there. That's a signature of the solid fuel engine igniting. Again, dirty, just like charcoal. Um, so take a look at those two missiles. They look pretty similar. But uh, here we can talk a bit about the advantages of solid fuel. Solid fuel missile systems are generally more survivable and more responsive. Um, liquid fuel systems require fueling before they can be used. When, when you're fueling missiles out in the field, you generate satellite signatures, which help the United States and South Korea know what you're up to and go in for that preemptive strike. Um, so with a system like this, you have a missile that is sealed in a tube with the propellant built into the casing. 
you wheel it out, you turn it up, you fire it. Um, the, the effective time from um, wanting to, you know, from the order being issued from Kim Jong-un to the missile leaving its canister is considerably shorter than the two or three hours it would take for North Korea to fuel up one of its liquid fuel missiles. Um, all right, so we talked about the Musudan a bit, that missile that failed eight, um, seven out of eight times last year. Um, so ultimately, though, we got to this point, which is uh, this missile here is the Hwasong-12. Hwasong means Mars, so the Mars-12 missile. This missile they first began testing in April this year, and it's based on an entirely new um, engine that they first tested in March this year that they've called the March 18th Revolution. Um, and when they tested that engine, they actually very cryptically hinted in their state media that the world will soon realize the significance of, of this engine. So this was the significance of that engine. This is um, an incredibly high performance intermediate range ballistic missile that is capable of striking the US territory of Guam. Um, and they've demonstrated that unambiguously. They um, flew it over Japan twice you know, on August 29th and September 14th. Um, they flew it past Japan, and the second test actually flew to a range in excess of what, it, um, of what would be required to strike Guam. And this was the missile they were talking about in August, by the way, when they said that they would uh, carry out an enveloping strike around Guam to demonstrate that they can hold U.S. military targets at risk. Um, but the Hwasong-12 was uh, an entirely new system this year. And a lot of experts, when these images began came out, uh, coming out, specifically that image in the, in the bottom right corner, which is from the first Hwasong-12 test that succeeded, really saw something interesting, which is that this uh, really looks like the first step towards an intercontinental range ballistic missile. Um, and of course, what we haven't talked about yet is payload. Uh, you know, the specific nuclear device that North Korea would be looking to develop. Um, so this here is a, a fairly famous photograph at this point. It was released last March. It's an undated photo. We don't know when it was taken, but it shows uh, Kim Jong-un, the North Korean Supreme Leader, posing with a mock-up of what is a compact and standardized fission device. So fission device is basically the simplest form of an atomic bomb, similar to the Fat Man device that was dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. Um, Yield-wise, it's probably in the similar range, um, maybe 20 to 30 kilotons, uh, similar to the nuclear device that North Korea tested in its fifth test last September. Um, but uh, effectively, this would be, uh, this is compact enough to fit on uh, pretty much all of the ballistic missiles that I just described. Um, so it is, um, it is compact, according to the U.S. intelligence community, the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency, um, and actually the entire intelligence community uh, in consensus this summer um, effectively assessed that North Korea had gotten to a point where it could mount these on any of its missiles. Um, so its, its first strike strategy is really, it's really backed up by, by more than just words. Um, these capabilities are real, and uh, they can employ them if they need to. Um, and, you know, that's just a cutesy name. It's not formally called the disco ball, but it's something that Western analysts use uh, to, to, to refer to this device, um, simply because it resembles a disco ball in some ways. But it's kind of the, uh, the dark, strange, lovian humor that kind of comes with nuclear weapons a lot of the times. And uh, it actually gets better in a, in a few slides. Um, so a lot of this, you know, you might be thinking, um, if Kim Jong-un uses the nuclear weapons, isn't that effectively suicide for him, right? I mean, everything I've talked about so far, our first strike against U.S. military targets, any country does that, the United States will retaliate with, with fire and fury, as President Trump said. Um, and that's just simply, it's, it's not the case. And the reason for that not being the case is this bad boy, the Hwasong-14, or what the U.S. intelligence community calls the KN-20. It's North Korea's first intercontinental range ballistic missile to have seen flight tes uh, a, a flight testing. It saw flight testing twice on the 4th of July this year and on July 28th. They've tested it twice. Uh, they've demonstrated, at least in the second flight test, that if they flew it at a normal trajectory, it would be capable of reaching U.S. homeland targets uh, on the West Coast, probably as far as Chicago, and if they changed the payload a bit and they relied on the Earth's rotation a bit, they could probably even reach the East Coast. Um, so this was a huge development, and that first stage of the missile, the, the bottom part, looks quite similar to the Hwasong-12. So these missiles are related. Um, so these are just a few more pictures of, of this uh, Hwasong-14 uh, intercontinental range ballistic missile um, up in the corner. That's a photo from the U.S. intelligence community looking at the second stage spy, um, of flying in outer space. And so why does this missile give North Korea that final bit of insurance that it needs? Oh, I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, why, does it, uh, why does it give it that second bit of insurance to effectively be able to rationally carry out a first use of its nuclear weapons without ensuring that Kim Jong-un um, will face destruction? And the reason for that is because it changes the U.S. deterrence calculation. For the United States, um, 
effectively since China broke out with an intercontinental range ballistic missile with uh, nuclear capabilities, the U.S. has never contended with an adversary that is so openly hostile to it uh, in, in possession of such a capability. North Korea is now one of these states. It, is, it has shown that not only does it have nuclear weapons that it can mount on these ballistic missiles, but that its missiles can reach the United States. So the question that the United States and South Korea would have to ask in that conventional invasion that gets preempted by North Korea in its very early stages is that do we continue with this invasion knowing that we are leaving Los Angeles, San Diego, Chicago, Washington DC, New York City, potentially open to nuclear retaliation? And the North Koreans are betting that the answer to that uh, in the Pentagon, in the White House, would be no. Uh, that no U.S. president would, would take that risk. Um, that it's simply not worth it. And, and not only that, they're assuming that just the entire process, going back to the beginning, to that decision to take the preemptive first strike, would simply be deterred by, by this ICBM capability. And there is something to that. Um, we can talk about missile defenses a bit in the Q&A. It's not the focus of this presentation. But even, even U.S. missile defense capabilities aren't good enough to shield us from North Korean retaliation. Um, and they have been working also on a more, a more impressive payload for their ICBMs. Um, this is the device that analysts have been calling Mr. Peanut. Again, a little cutesy name. Um, and you might realize that it looks a little bit like a peanut, and that's because it's a two-stage thermonuclear device, which is what the North Koreans claim that this device is. We don't know that for sure. But this is what they detonated just a few months ago in September uh, in, what, in what generated a 62 seismic event on the moment magnitude scale, um, you know, of vibrations felt way out in uh, northern China. Um, but the payload of this device uh, was effectively the largest man-made explosion on Earth since 1992, since China carried out a nuclear test at Lopnur, which generated a yield of 600 kilotons. I don't know what the specific yield of this device is. Analysts are still debating it. It's very difficult to pin down nuclear yields from tests that are carried out underground, especially when you don't know the specific seismic data of the site. But the takeaway here is that it's big, it is very big, it is big enough to flatten most of a city. And let's talk a bit about, you know, this idea that you'll sometimes hear about in the press that, oh, you know, North Korea might have an ICBM, but it doesn't have a perfect ICBM. Its ICBMs aren't accurate. Um, accuracy simply doesn't matter when it comes to larger payloads. So this is a little animation. Um, the circles that you see here are, um, represent what's called circular error probable, which means uh, if you took, you know, 100, Oh, this is New York City, by the way, where I live. So if you took 100 strikes at New York City with North Korea's ballistic missile, with this payload, uh, and the assumptions that I used actually were that this North Korean missile would have effectively the accuracy of a Soviet missile from the 60s. So not very impressive. So the red is effectively the primary fireball, but effectively, no matter what happens, um, it would create quite a bit of damage. Um, and this right here is that same animation playing out with a much higher payload. So the precision really doesn't matter when it comes to striking sort of urban population centers with large um, ballistic missiles, right? I mean, with a larger payload, you effectively get around that accuracy problem. Accuracy, this idea of having a perfect ICBM, uh, it, it, it's simply a non-starter for North Korea. And we've recently heard U.S. military officials, uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Dunford, Strategic Commander Hyten, um, talk about the fact that U.S. military planners should today take this capability seriously. North Korea still has a few steps to go to perfect this. Uh, specifically, its re-entry vehicles are a little imperfect, uh, but it's getting there. Um, I am getting to the close of my, um, uh, to the end of my presentation, uh, but this map is just, um, again, from the Washington Post graphics team on um, looking at uh, likely homeland targets. I've, uh, I've mentioned most of, the, uh, most of these uh, Barksdale Air Force bases on there. It's where the U.S. bases quite a few of its bombers. Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri, possibly. Hawaii. Um, so there are, you know, clear targets that we've seen in North Korean propaganda. Um, so why, you know, why do I think that North Korea's strategy so much, you know, why does it rely on this ICBM to really kind of flesh it out? So here's uh, just the North Koreans in their own word. They release these statements via their state media. Um, so the Hwasong-12 and the Pukuk-Song-2, those two missiles that I talked about, other new types of strategic weapons, they show their capabilities for actual war, which means the kind of theater level preemption, um, preventing preemption and invasion that they would need. And then the successful test fire of the ICBM is a final gateway, final gateway to the completion of the country's nuclear force, proving that the U.S. mainland is within the striking range of the DPRK's weapons. And then the second quote from May, before they tested the ICBM, uh, they were very clear about this. The U.S. mainland is the final target of the DPRK strategic rockets tipped with powerful nuclear warheads, the final target. So they would use their weapons first in theater, and then the final target would be the homeland. 
Um, and this just is from the September UN General Assembly speech by the North Korean foreign minister talking about why his country has his nuclear weapons. He claims that it is for deterrence. It is for a balance of power with the United States. They really want the United States to take the hint to stop talking about preemption, to stop talking about military options. Uh, they want effectively that insurance, that security for the country's supreme leadership, for Kim Jong-un. Um, so, like he says, our national nuclear force is, for all intents and purposes, a war deterrent for putting an end to the nuclear threat of the United States. They feel threatened. They long talk about the United States' hostile policy, quote unquote, against them. Uh, and they think nuclear weapons are the way out of this. Um, and they will likely never give up their nuclear weapons or enter into an agreement that would put their nuclear weapons on the table because they've seen what happened to Saddam Hussein, what happened to Muammar Gaddafi when uh, they entered into similar agreements for disarmament with the United States. So, like I said, I promised I'd end with some good news. And the good news is that I think deterrence can work with North Korea. There's no evidence that Kim Jong-un is irrational to the point where um, he would not be subject to the same kinds of incentives and react in the same way to US threats as the Soviet Union did, as China did. Uh, deterrence can work with North Korea. Nuclear deterrence can work with North Korea. Conventional deterrence has worked with North Korea. Deterrence isn't foolproof, but it's certainly better than the alternative option, which is a, a coercive form of um, regime change, which would certainly um, expose Seoul, Tokyo, and uh, regional targets to nuclear retaliation, but also very likely the U.S. homeland. We might get lucky. Their ICBM might not make it all the way here. Um, our missile defense interceptors might be able to prevent their ICBMs from getting here, but I would not bet on that. Um, it's, not, it's not a good bet for any president to take. The expected value of that bet is very low. Um, so deterrence can work, um, but the bad news in the short term is that the United States has been doing a pretty bad job of um, basically the basic ABCs of deterrence, um, being very clear and credible about what it is looking to prevent. Um, we have seen various members of this administration referring to various events that they're looking to prevent. Uh, President Trump has threatened to totally destroy North Korea. He's threatened nuclear first use for um, fire and fury in August for simply threats from North Korea. The North Koreans on the flip side have never seen a US president behave in the way that they're seeing right now. They have no idea what to make of this. It's, it, and it's a very dangerous uh, combination at this time when North Korea is clearly making itself known as the ninth nuclear power on Earth and one with a thermonuclear ICBM capability. Um, so it is, it is a dangerous time right now, but, but the good news is that deterrence can work and it simply needs the United States um, senior leadership to um, recognize that and at least begin reading from the same book on what we're looking um, for out of North Korea. Uh, so I'll stop there and we can uh, get to uh, more of this in the Q&A. Thanks. Thanks. Um, thanks so much for two terrific and sobering presentations that I think have given us all a, a lot of food for thought. Um, so before I open it up to the audience, I thought I would ask each one of you maybe one or two follow-up questions. Um, starting with Terry, first of all, I was wondering if perhaps you could give us an idea of what North Korea's cyber capabilities are like. There's been a little bit of discussion um, of, of uh, their cyber actions in the past, but um, I think it would be good for all of us to get a better sense um, of how proficient they are in that area. And second, I wanted to pick your brain uh, a little bit on the issue of regional dynamics, which is something I know you've studied pretty closely. So it was reported that at the state banquet in Seoul uh, this evening, Korean time, uh, South Korea invited an 88-year-old Korean comfort woman or former sex slave of the Japanese during World War II and served shrimp from the waters surrounding the Dokdo Islands, which are disputed in between uh, Japan and South Korea. Could you perhaps, for the benefit of myself and our audience, explain why the relationship in between both South Korea and Japan is so complex and why it continues to present so many challenges, not least to the US, as it tries to manage um, its Asian alliance portfolio and coordinate regional uh, defense policy amongst its allies. Um, Ankit, as you suggested throughout your presentation, it seems that over the past few months we've witnessed um, a lot of policy and government people in DC struggling to go through different stages of grief when it comes to the North Korean nuclear question from accepting that it is, not, that it is no longer so much a non-proliferation or denuclearization challenge as it is a very complex deterrence challenge. And when you look at some of the issues we may be facing in that sphere, particularly when it comes to deterring lower levels of aggression, such as the um, Chonan attack that uh, 
Terry mentioned earlier. Do you think that there are any parallels perhaps to be drawn from other parts of the world and maybe from South Asia and the so-called instability-stability paradox that has long reigned there? And finally, I was hoping if you might also not mind temporarily uh, donning your Asia regionalist cap to give us your thoughts on uh, Donald Trump's upcoming encounter with President Xi of China. Um, Donald Trump has repeatedly focused on China's role uh, with regard to finding some kind of solution to the North Korean issue, perhaps sometimes at the cost of um, focusing on China's own troubling patterns of behavior in the region. What will you be looking for during this visit, and is there anything in particular that is a source of concern for you? Thank you. So I didn't know which, which one wants to go sure. first. Um, let me start with the, the North Korean cyber piece. North Korea has a very active cyber unit. I, I believe the number is around 30,000 um, people dedicated to working on cyber issues. They have hacked uh, very successfully into a number of South Korean entities, banks, media outlets, um, government agencies. There are also some reports that they may have been able to siphon off money from, from some accounts. as a, Another way to pad the Treasury in the face of sanctions. I think it's interesting when you think about cyber as, again, sort of feeding into to Ankit's comments about North Korean rationality. I think they understand that there are certain red lines in regards to what they can and can't do. And cyber is an interesting avenue where North Korea can do a number of different things that may not necessarily provoke a military response, and yet they can cause mischief in a number of different ways. Uh, first of all, I mean, there's attribution questions just at, in, at the surface for cyber, but also even if it is traced back to being a North Korean action, what's the proper response? What's a proportionate response? So I think it's very interesting as a North Korean response to sort of play um, the, the line of what you can do and what you can't do. The South Korea-Japan uh, relationship is a very long and complicated one. It goes way back um, in history. But let me start with the most uh, recent issue that colors J Japanese South Korean relations. And that is from 1910 to 1945 when Korea was occupied by Japan. And for Koreans, this was a very, very difficult time, a very brutal occupation. And they maintain that Japanese officials, conservatives in particular, have not been fully um, sincere in their apologies for what they had done during that time period. We could spend an hour talking about that, but I think there are arguments on both sides for whether the Japanese have been fully contrite or not, but South Koreans certainly are not convinced of the sincerity of, of some of the Japanese um, actions. And it comes down to, again, the history of World War II as well as an island dispute that they have. You mentioned Dokdo uh, to Koreans. The Japanese call it Takashima. It's a very small uh, set of two islands off the East Coast. There's really not much at stake other than maybe some fishing. Uh, but for Koreans, this is a matter of national pride and is tied back to the occupation. And I dare say, while the United States tries to promote trilateral cooperation between Japan and, <laughs> and Korea, we have a long way to go before we are able to bridge some of this animosity that is, is going to go on for years, I'm afraid. Great. Um, Iskandar, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the uh, instability, the stability instability paradox, um, and also this idea of North Korea as a deterrence problem now instead of a denuclearization problem. I'd say, you know, first, I think those are two separate issues, but first, let me say, you know, I was pretty um, unambiguous, I guess, about the fact that denuclearization is very unlikely at this point, uh, that North Korea is a nuclear state. Um, we have one example, which is South Africa, of a, of a nuclear state that has had multiple bombs uh, effectively denuclearized, and those are under very specific circumstances that simply do not exist in North Korea. Um, but it's, it's one of the main divides right now that you'll see between people who are in government uh, working on North Korea and uh, non-proliferation and denuclearization and sort of independent analysts. Um, it'll be very difficult for someone who's in government to ever come to that conclusion. And there are good reasons that I sympathize with here. Um, there are real negative consequences for the global non-proliferation regime, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, for example, if, uh, if North Korea is allowed to um, 
effectively get away with its nuclear program. It will get away, but it depends on the way in which it gets away with its nuclear program. If it receives um, any kind of broader acceptance into the nuclear, um, into the global community, uh, that's a blow to the NPT. North Korea is the only country to have ever joined the NPT, left the NPT, and broken out with a thermonuclear ICBM. No one else has done that. Um, India, Pakistan, Israel never joined the NPT, uh, developed their own nuclear programs outside of it. Um, so, uh, so there are good reasons uh, for that. And the stability instability paradox is this idea that uh, nuclear weapons give states um, room to uh, play around with uh, levels of provocation uh, at a much lower rung on, on the escalation ladder. Um, and I know what Iskander was getting at here. The example that comes to mind is Pakistan. Um, the South Asian example is, is quite interesting. So India and Pakistan have fought a war since both acquired nuclear weapons, uh, the Cargill War in 1999. But more broadly, um, Pakistan, um, under its nuclear umbrella, has uh, you know, sponsored all sorts of uh, non-state actors against Indian interests. Um, and North Korea, uh, this actually is something that I've been thinking about quite a bit. Um, Terry noted out, uh, you know, pointed in his presentation that since 2010, North Korea's leadership has uh, seen that uh, you know, the, the deterrence um, in the US-South Korean alliance is quite credible. They haven't really tested the alliance in a way similar to the shelling of uh, Yongpyeongdo and uh, the sinking of the Chonan. Um, but the North Koreans, uh, if you look at the broader history, you know, going back all the way to the end of the Korean War, uh, they are quite adept at, at the sort of low level, um, um, the art of the low level provocation, so to call it. So my expectation, um, a sort of theoretical expectation is that um, as North Korea's nuclear forces are fully operationalized, grow more diverse, grow more credible, they will uh, return to their um, pre-2010 ways and 2010 uh, example of, of sort of testing the alliance at the low level. Um, and that's because their overarching strategic objective, um, you know, I, I talked about how what Kim Jong-un uh, wants above all is his own survival, but they do have strategic objectives. They want, uh, they want to reunify the peninsula under their terms. They want to break the alliance. They want to evict the United States from Northeast Asia. And uh, part of the way that they're going to go about that, I think, is with those kinds of low-level uh, provocations. Um, so that's uh, something to watch out for, I guess, uh, in the next five to 10 years. And um, on the second question of um, Trump's visit with uh, Xi Jinping, um, so Trump, like, uh, and this isn't a Trump thing only, it's a, it's a very common answer. We heard it last year whenever North Korea came up at a uh, presidential debate, either in the primary or the general. What are you going to do about North Korea? I'm going to tell China to solve it. It's China's problem. It's, it's kind of the first answer that people run to, because North Korea is a very difficult problem. There are no good answers. But an answer that I think has inherent appeal for many American policymakers is that China is this uh, massive benefactor for North Korea. It accounts for 90% of its trade. That much is true. And that if it wanted, it could simply flick the switch on Kim Jong-un's nuclear ambitions. Um, but that's far from the truth. Um, a lot of what I was describing up there, those new impressive ballistic missiles, you know, those aren't being imported wholesale from China. The know-how isn't being imported wholesale from China. Yes, North Korean scientists are being educated partly in China, um, but a lot of this missile activity and development is indigenous. The North Koreans have had a very bad relationship with China in, its, in recent years, actually. In uh, 2013, late December, um, some of you might recall that Kim Jong-un killed his own uncle. He executed his own uncle, Chang song Tech. Um, and Jiang was actually under Kim Jong-il, kind of the main intermediary between Beijing and Pyongyang. And that was... Uh, kind of led into this broader era of just very chilly relations between the two sides. Uh, things are interesting right now. After the 19th Party Congress in China recently, Kim Jong-un extended uh, personal congratulations to Xi Jinping. Um, so, and they didn't carry out a ballistic missile test during the Congress, so maybe things are improving. So when Trump talks to Xi, I think he will be looking for, um, first of all, just assurances on sanctions enforcement. There are signs the Chinese are doing more. They've acquiesced at the United Nations to more um, extensive sanctions than they ever have before, even though there are still limits on on uh, oil imports, um, you know, North Korea will continue to receive oil from, from China for some time. Um, the Chinese have strategic interests on the peninsula that I think will be very difficult to move. In fact, they're probably um, immovable. Uh, one of those interests is that they will not tolerate a unified peninsula that is allied with the United States. And another strategic interest is that they do not want a complete disintegration of the North Korean regime that leads to 
a refugee crisis that leads to um, you know warring factions of nuclear armed warlords effectively um, you know a fact is when North Korea has nuclear weapons you're gonna have to think about what happens when the regime collapses what happens to those weapons what happens to those biological and chemical weapons so the Chinese prefer this uneasy status quo that we have right now they uh, they publicly claim to support denuclearization and I think that's a genuine preference that if it was possible they would prefer a denuclearized peninsula to one with a uh, thermonuclear ICBM um, and and they do propose um, a return to diplomatic talks they've been very clear about preferring a diplomatic solution as well so when when Trump meets Xi I think a lot of this will be on the agenda um, but I'm, I'm not expecting any sort of major breakthrough on on the North Korean issue I'm not expecting any sort of um, assurances from China on a military action for example that will continue to be off the table as far as China is concerned um, but it should be a uh, it should be a very interesting meeting between the two leaders Great, thank you. Well, I think we have some time for questions. Um, so if anyone has a question, uh, please just wait for the mic. Uh, Teresa is walking around with a mic as we speak. And um, I might try and take uh, groupings of two or three questions at a time so that everyone gets to ask the question they want to ask. Thank you. The, uh, my question has to do with the strategic implications of all of this discussion for Japan. It seems to me that the U.S. Uh, nuclear uh, umbrella if, protecting Japan um, was credible until North Korea can destroy Los Angeles. So now the, the American president has to decide whether he'd rather trade off a nuclear missile that was, for, was aimed at Yokohama, unfortunately was 30 miles to the north and obliterated Tokyo. Um, so, you know, what's the choice then? I, to me, if I were the Japanese, you know, the era of depending on the United States to protect them must be strategically called into question. And the same question I, I would ask for South Korea. Um, if North Korea's uh, nuclear deterrent is credible vis-a-vis -vis the United States, both parties, it would seem to me, have to say thank you very much. It's been terrific. But uh, we need to move on and be able to sit at the table ourselves rather than you know, hiring the Americans to do it. So that sounded like a speech rather than a question, but uh, I'm trying to make it a question. Thank you. Great, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Oh, yes, there's one right there at the back, I think. Right there at the back, Teresa. My question is, uh, what is the likelihood that North Korea's cyber operations will follow the logic of their conventional weapons acquisitions? Okay, and maybe one last question before the panelists respond. Yes, you briefly mentioned the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which seems to me to, to be the most important and perhaps successful treaty on Earth, whereby 184 countries out of the 193 on Earth have sworn off nuclear weapons. My question is, um, how well did Donald Trump understand the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty when he suggested that South Korea, Japan, and maybe even Saudi Arabia, uh, might, it might be good if they got them too, which seems to me would collapse the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Did Trump understand that treaty? Great, thanks. Well, we have three excellent questions, really. Um, first question on basically the challenges posed to extended deterrence and the resurgence of what during the Cold War we call the decoupling issue. Um, second question um, on North Korea's cyber capabilities. And um, the third question um, on uh, what this administration's stance is when it comes to non-proliferation. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll just briefly jump in on, because uh, I think two of those questions are actually quite related, the first and the third. Um, so um, this, this idea of decoupling uh, is something that the United States um, rudely discovered when the Soviet Union acquired ICBMs. Um, like today, we worry about reassuring Seoul and Tokyo that we would use nuclear weapons against North Korea if their cities were attacked. Uh, so it was, you know, with Bonn, with Paris, with London, it led to Charles de Gaulle pulling France out, out of NATO, pursuing its own, um, its own independent deterrent. Um, and uh, the idea of, uh, you know, Germany breaking out as well after the Second World War was an important concern under, under uh, Conrad Adenauer. Um, this idea of extended deterrence, it isn't, it isn't simply an idea of... Um, 
it is an altruism for the United States. Um, it has good strategic rationale by by South Korea and, and Japan relying on the United States to provide the uh, effective and overwhelming quote unquote um, force for any war on the Korean Peninsula, uh, there's less of a chance that they will initiate a nuclear war that the United States would then have to finish. Um, I think it is it is correct that if South Korea or Japan were to break out uh, and pursue their own nuclear weapons, it would lead to the end of the alliance, which would actually be an important victory for Kim Jong Un uh, when you think about his overarching goal of evicting the United States from Northeast Asia. Um, but uh, but the overall you know non-proliferation consequences of South Korean and Japanese breakout are severe. They're both parties to the NPT. Um, right now, um, there is no serious intention, um, effect, except for some fringe voices in both countries, um, about nuclear breakout. Um, but this is why, I mean, this alliance, this is why I've been watching this trip um, that the president's currently on so closely. Um, when North Korea tested its ICBM this summer, the alliance reassurance task, which is already incredibly difficult, you know, there's this old saying that the reason the United States has nuclear weapons is 90% to do with assurance and only 10% about deterring enemies. 90% of it is to reassure, you know, NATO allies, to reassure Northeast Asian allies. And it becomes significantly more difficult with the North Korean ICBM. Um, so I think this is a, um, you know, both of those questions I think are absolutely central here. It's that uh, this alliance management task is significantly more challenging with that ICBM. And and yes, I mean, the the end goal, the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, for, for North Korea is that South Korea and Japan end up deciding that U.S. assurances aren't credible, that the United States will never um, leave Los Angeles open to a nuclear strike for Tokyo, and it will pursue its own nuclear weapons. Let me just add to that and, and also say that I, I can recommend a good book on the nuclear umbrella. Um, that I think you, you raise some very important questions, but I would even go beyond the North Korean nuclear capability. The argument I make in that book is that I think it has been for many years unlikely the United States would use nuclear weapons to defend um, either of those allies. I think the United States would absolutely be there to defend uh, South Korea and Japan, and imagine what the North Koreans, or the Chinese for that matter, because the nuclear umbrella isn't just North Korea, it's about China as well. What would those countries have done to have the United States considering using nuclear weapons? They would have had to have crossed a very serious red line. And I think at that point, the United States with support from the international community would be, I mean, we would be looking at regime change and why irradiate the peninsula if we are going to be moving north and taking out the North Korean uh, regime. But I think that as well, it is largely about political reassurance. And so I, I agree that it is, it has been much more about a political signal to these allies um, as well as a non-proliferation tool, that it has been the guarantee that then assures that South Korea and Japan will not believe that they need to acquire their own nuclear weapons, but certainly when North Korea has its own nuclear capability and is able to reach the United States, now the decoupling, decoupling issues uh, come into play. But I'm still um, not convinced that that's necessarily going to be, to be the case. Just add as a little anecdote that um, a week ago, some of my uh, French friends in government uh, told me that in the course of dialogues with their South Korean counterparts, they were asked a lot of questions about uh, uh, what drove France to develop its own uh, independent uh, nuclear deterrent and what were the drivers behind that decision. So it's obviously something that is uh, very much on their mind. Okay, do we have uh, any more questions? Fantastic. Um, uh, yes, I was wondering, <clears throat> I had read reports that uh, part of the ICBM testing that was done, the leap forward they took was because they had appropriated some uh, Russian or Ukrainian engine designs, if not actual engines themselves. And I saw this in two separate places. I was just wondering if, this, if you had heard this, if it was true or... Uh, because my impression was always the Russians and the North Koreans didn't get along all that well. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah, so the Russians and the North Koreans are actually getting along much better than they used to. Um, there was a there was a dip for a while, but now they're getting along pretty well. Um, and I'm aware of the report you're talking about. It was uh, it was in the New York Times, I think, um, uh, just a few months ago. And I actually wrote a report um, pushing back against it, and and quite a few people pushed back against it. Uh,
uh, specifically the insinuation that um, the engine that sits at the bottom of their ICBM, um, the incredible, um, incredibly powerful kind of 40 ton force engine was kind of imported wholesale, uh, transferred illicitly from uh, the former Soviet Union, either Ukraine or Russia. That simply isn't the case. Um, U.S. intelligence uh, sources have said that that's not the case. Um, it is the case, however, that the North Koreans take design influence uh, from former um, Soviet engines, um, specifically Ukrainian engines. So, um, if you if you do want to read more about this, the engine that we currently think is at the bottom of this ICBM is uh, the Soviet RD-250 engine, which is originally from Ukraine. But uh, the assumption now is that the North Koreans um, are manufacturing that indigenously. Um, and they have, may have had those designs for um, multiple decades now since the end of the Cold War. Um, but it's not the case that they're um, importing um, engine assemblies wholesale and using them on these ballistic missiles. And there is a logic to that. I mean, they don't test <coughs> ballistic missiles like a country that's prone to kind of external supply shocks. They test at um, at their pace. They test as they need for their um, own know-how and their program to advance. Um, and you know, there was a similar report about their fuel that they were reliant on China for their um, China or Russia for their liquid propellants. That's also not the case. Um, they're manufacturing those propellants indigenously. This again goes back to that question of why can't China solve this problem? Um, a, a big part is you know China does have ninety percent of the ec economic leverage, but when it comes to their actual capabilities, it's a it's a highly uh, autarkic program. Uh, their supply chain is indigenous. Their um, knowledge is indigenous. Uh, these are things that once a country gets to this point, uh, the only thing that's going to put a cap on this program is going to be some sort of diplomatic agreement with verification. Um, so yeah, they are um, they know what they're doing and they're able to do it themselves. Great. Well, I'm glad to know we have more than one missile geek in this room. Uh, we have a question from the young lady here. Yes. Um, if it came to be that the U.S., South Korea, and North Korea went into conflict, is there a possibility that Russia and the People's Republic of China may join in this clash? Uh, what would be their stance? That's a very good question. That's a, that is a very interesting question, and I, I think the short answer is it depends on, on what this looks like. I, I am not, I mean, there are, there are some who are arguing Russia is increasing its, its influence and interest in the region. I'm not entirely convinced of that. I think the North Koreans have reached out to the Russians on a number of occasions because they recognize the dependence that they have economically and politically on the Chinese and aren't particularly pleased that they are that reliant on China uh, and, and fear that China could do something if they chose to uh, exert more pressure on North Korea. But I'm not entirely convinced that, that Putin is, is interested in doing that. I mean, I think, I think he understands that the degree to which he gets involved in that becomes a liability potentially for him. Now, I will say this, though, that certainly if he sees an opportunity to perhaps poke the United States or receive some political advantage that way, I mean, I think he would not hesitate. But I think he is, is somewhat limited. There, I think, though, the China piece is the more interesting question. And certainly when you think about the possibility of some sort of North Korean collapse or implosion or something that would now necessitate some outside intervention. I think the Chinese would not hesitate to get involved in some way. Now, there's a couple of ways that could go. I mean, I think certainly they would come across the border to at least ensure whatever problems are going on in the north stay to the south and don't cross over into China. But there are some who have argued perhaps they might move into Pyongyang, reassert some other leadership into North Korea to make sure it is more stable. I'm not certain of that, and I'm not sure the Chinese have necessarily thought through all of those things. But I think one of the things that concerns me is when you look at some of these potential scenarios and think that the Chinese, the South Koreans, the United States, there will be perhaps some fairly quick decisions where there are going to have to be some responses. And the degree to which we could get in each other's way mm -hmm. could be very problematic. I hope, although I'm not optimistic on this, that we are perhaps talking with China about some of these possibilities. Again, I don't think that's happening, but I think it would be very helpful 
quietly if that is done so that that does not become a problem because I think it certainly could be. Can I jump in just for a second? Um, so China and North Korea, um, in 1961, they signed a treaty between Kim Il-sung and, um, and Mao Zedong. And uh, that treaty, uh, Article 2 of that treaty, has a mutual defense provision. So it's just like the U.S.-South Korea alliance. If one of them's attacked, the other has to come to their defense. Um, in the early 2010s, China is believed to have formally conveyed that the terms of that treaty had changed to North Korea. Um, and part of that has to do with deterrence. The Chinese do not want a war in Northeast Asia. Uh, it's just broadly disruptive, obviously, to kind of their broader economic and strategic goals in the region. Um, but uh, the current understanding is that if North Korea were to start a war, uh, like I said, you know, North Korea has a, a first use posture. So if they were to start a war, the Chinese would leave them on their own. Um, and a lot of kind of the missiles that I was talking about, if you look at this missile program, if you look at this nuclear force that's developing in North Korea, this is very much a country that intends to fight and win a nuclear war on its own. It's not a country that relies on a patron to come in and save it. Um, and for the United States, that has interesting implications, because if the United States believes that it's credible that China will enter a war on North Korea's side if it decides to initiate a first strike, that presumably will deter the United States um, from, from carrying out such a first strike. So the Chinese have reasons to um, make it appear as if they would um, side with North Korea if a, if a war were to break out. But, uh, but more broadly, I think it's, it's unlikely um, that you know, the assurance stands as it did in 1961, uh, that the North Koreans have any sort of blanket assurance from the Chinese. If they started something, they're probably on their own. Great. I think we have time for maybe just two more questions. Um, nice. So I was just wondering, given the development of um, methods that the United States is looking to to affect the EM sphere, whether it be you know via hacking, via EM jamming, um, new EMP capabilities that we've that we've begun to test, I would be wondering if there's any possibility that if it came to a, like a first strike or a preemptive strike, that we that the United States using those capabilities would be able to cut the nuclear head from the North Korean snake. Okay, um, and maybe one one more question. Ah, there we go. Thank you. I have a two-part question for you. Okay, uh, assuming, for what I've gathered, what you gentlemen have said that the North Koreans achieve the nuclear balance, uh, the nuclear balance with the United States, i.e. that the ICBM uh, turns out to be successful and they reach a balance, all right? They don't cross the red line, but they're at a nuclear balance. What effect does that strategy result in, the no in, in I'm changing now the subject, with Iran? Iran is probably watching what's going on with this, um, you know, back and forth between the United States and North Korea, what do you think is the impact if North Korea reaches this nuclear balance? Okay, how do you think the Iranians are going to react? Are they going to say, "All right, we like we we see what the North Koreans are doing. We're going to adopt the same strategy"? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So basically, I believe the first question was. Are there any uh, non-kinetic means of uh, disabling North Cor um, Korean command and control or North Korea's nuclear arsenal that uh, we perhaps are not paying enough attention to? And the second question was, what are the um, global ramifications of North Korea's nuclear breakout? Let's say. Well, in regards to the first question, it's going to depend on, on what kind of first strike you're talking about. If it is a matter of the United States perhaps launching a couple of cruise missiles to perhaps take out a ballistic missile on the launch pad or on a mobile launcher, or if North Korea has just tested and, and the administration decides they've had enough and they're going to send something. Uh, I mean, then that notion of, of, of electronic jamming and those kinds of things probably is not going to happen. But if we are going to send airplanes there, now you're talking about the North Korean air defense system, which that is 
understood to be fairly capable, that they have a wide array of interceptors, they have anti-aircraft artillery that is very robust. Um, there would most likely be some effort to try to jam their communication systems, their early warning systems to allow that, although we'd probably send stealth aircraft in, which would have less of a problem dealing with that. But if it were a no kidding taking out the regime, well now all those things are on the table because the first thing you would want to do is take out their air defense, gain air superiority, and start to create an environment where you are able to operate freely without North Korea being able to jeopardize your assets that you would be sending in. Uh, but I am fully with Ankit on this. Gosh, I hope we don't go in that direction mm -hmm. because I think, again, as you saw, and, and to, to come back just to make one quick point to the second question, and then I'll turn it over, that when you look at deterrence on the Korean Peninsula, we both try to deter each other, and it's been going on for years. Again, the North Koreans don't need nuclear weapons to deter the United States and South Korea. You saw the map that I put up with the circles for artillery and rocket launcher systems. They have the ability with conventional weapons to punish South Korea and don't really need nuclear weapons. And so, you know, again, we have been trying to deter each other for years, and I am confident, as Ankit is, that, that we are heading into a new status quo, and we have clearly had that status quo disrupted, but we will eventually arrive at a new normal, but it's going to include a nuclear North Korea, and I think we are going to have to learn to live with that nuclear North Korea and can be successful in deterring that North Korea, but it's going to be a different security environment. Completely back that. Um, I'm, I'm glad somebody brought up the idea of uh, command and control and what happens if we cut the head off the snake, as you, so, um, as you said. Um, this is one of the things I've been thinking about a lot recently. Uh, it's something we don't know a lot about. We don't know a lot about North Korea's command and control. If their um, nuclear forces fail safe or fail deadly, uh, fail deadly is the one we should worry about. It's that if Kim Jong-un is killed, are there standing orders for nuclear use with his um, commanders and subordinates? Or have they been pre-delegated authority to use those weapons in a crisis? In peacetime, North Korea has been pretty clear since 2012, uh, 2013, that Kim Jong-un is the only person in the country, like in the United States, where the president is the only person that can authorize nuclear use. Kim Jong-un is the only person in North Korea that can authorize nuclear use. Um, but we don't know how that changes in a crisis. We don't know how that changes when Pyongyang is um, annihilated. What happens to every single nuclear weapon that is in a hardened site that the United States might not know about? Are those launched unilaterally? Um, so those questions, I think, deserve um, good answers before uh, you know anything like it, anything even close to a, uh, an attack is considered, be it kinetically or, or even uh, non-kinetically. Um, and how does North Korea react if we cut off their communications? Do they assume that there's been a strike on the National Command Authority and do they decide to launch all their nuclear weapons? So these command and control questions are, are a big uh, question mark that uh, I think um, it deserves more scrutiny. And here, you know, U.S. intelligence um, probably does know a lot more than is in the public domain. Um, but I would, I would certainly hope that we have good answers to those questions before we uh, contemplate any sort of strike, which we shouldn't do. Um, the question of Iran, um, I think, you know, I think we can generalize that question. I mean, Iran uh, does, does um, I guess, merit special attention because um, obviously we have an agreement with Iran um, to restrain their nuclear program. Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons, obviously. It doesn't have an intercontinental range ballistic missile. It has tested satellite launchers uh, to date, but it has not tested an ICBM. Um, even though uh, there are um, hints that Iranian scientists are cooperating with North Korea on its ballistic missiles, not on nuclear weapons, but they're cooperating with North Korea on ballistic missiles. Um, the lessons for Iran, I think, um, would be the same as for any country. I mean, the non-proliferation consequences that I talked about of a country leaving the NPT and getting away with it, so to speak, would, would reverberate quite widely. Um, and it, but again, like I said, it depends on the level of acceptance that North Korea gets. Part of what North Korea will eventually want is a normal diplomatic relationship with the United States. It's not so clear that North Korea would actually want 
global economic integration simply because that's a threat to the Kim regime. And uh, you know, in a globalized age, integrating with the global economy means ideas um, flow into your country as well, and in addition to goods. Um, so those incentives, I think, are very different between North Korea and Iran as well. Um, the, the flip side that I will add, and this is a bit of a, an ancillary comment, uh, which is that you know the, the recent uh, decision to decertify the uh, JCPOA, the 2015 nuclear agreement, the ramifications of that will be appreciated in Pyongyang, where, like I mentioned in my presentation, the um, the you know uh, the Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi examples are repeatedly cited in state media and propaganda. Um, so U.S. credibility in in any future agreement or negotiation with North Korea, I think, will take a hit as a result of that decertification. Thanks. Well, on that note, I think we've come to the end of our discussion. Thanks so much for coming out. Um, I hope that uh, this discussion wasn't too stressful for you. Um, I'd add that it's perhaps one of those rare occasions where it's actually better to live in Providence than in Santa Barbara uh, for, the, for the reasons that, uh, that Anke had outlined. I'd like to thank Teresa Haas and Aaron Demers for helping make this event possible, and I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking our two terrific panelists. <laughs>